Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Sean Katona. Sean, thanks for being on the show. Great to be here. Sean is a full-time real estate investor, landlord, and national speaker. He owns income property across four states and has spearheaded 70-plus deals ranging from value-add renovations to new construction. Today, his focus is revitalizing retail shopping centers and apartment buildings to maximize returns for friends and family. Sean, thanks again for your time and being on the show today. And, uh, you know, tell the listeners a little more about who you are and, and what you're doing or, or focused on right now. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess you kind of took the words out of my mouth there, but um, my I guess I got started in real estate uh, all the way back in 2009. I was working at Microsoft at the time and had been able to save up enough money that I thought, you know, hey, let's go grab a rental property. So uh, I did that and I kind of fumbled my way through a couple of deals, um, got into the fix and flip space, got into rental rental houses, did that for a few years. In 2013, I think I went full time at that. And so, uh, you know, I have a, a good variety of projects, I guess you could say, everything from wholesale projects to, like you said, new construction, uh, a lot of fix and flip. And then more recently, that's that's been, you know, really focused on commercial properties. So apartment buildings and then shopping centers are basically my favorite category right now. Um, and most of my business Today that I'm currently working on is happening in Phoenix. So I live in Orange County, but I, I do business um, about a 90 minute flight away. So it's, it's possible to do day trips, but still get really good returns. Awesome. Awesome. So can you talk a little bit about to the transition from, you know, the, the flipping business to what you're doing now or, or even just why? Why and how did you do that? No, great question. Um, well, I, I just didn't know commercial real estate or investing even existed. Like when I was growing up, you know, I didn't come from a family with uh, you know tremendous wealth, and I wasn't surrounded by people who did the business at that level. So it's just it's where you got started. It's what you saw on TV, and it's kind of what I knew. So I, I took a run at that, and I think it was helpful in that I, I got to learn a lot of lessons the hard way. Uh, maybe in in deals that had a, a fewer zeros and one less comma behind them. So you kind of learn the ropes of real estate, the fundamentals. And then, you know, as we started to shift gears into bigger projects, it was great to have that that resume to, to point to and that deal history and just understanding how to do things like force appreciation, manage construction projects, uh, manage debt, manage equity. So a lot of the things that are relevant for commercial were also, you know, utilized on the, on the residential or the single family side of the business. And, See, I guess what inspired me to, to kind of steer the ship or switch gears, I, you know, once you start to see the numbers on the bigger deals, I think it just comes down to opportunity cost. You know, we've only got so many hours in the day. And so would I rather do five or 10 smaller deals or one maybe higher quality, bigger deal that has more tax advantages, that has you know the potential for more cash flow or, you know, you're not spending as much time managing and grinding on some of the details that can come along with you know at one point i had about 15 flips going simultaneously uh, and that was a lot of construction to manage and a lot of personalities to manage and personnel so uh, for those of us who've done that i'm, I'm sure uh, they can appreciate some of that what was what was key in in moving from that business to going into commercial what was uh, you know give us a one or two things that was like you got to have this in place I think it was invaluable that I'd already had experience raising capital, uh, both both debt and equity. And so I understood how to communicate that to people. Um, I, I knew how to talk to bankers. I knew how to source quality deals. I knew that, you know, I probably look at 99, or excuse me, look at 100 deals, pass on 99 of those to buy one high quality deal. And I said, that's very similar from from residential to commercial. You know, we're working through agents, we're working through brokers to find good deals, but not all of them make sense for our buying criteria. I guess 
what's been consistent throughout my career is finding value add projects. So it's either fixer upper houses, or today it's it's fixer upper shopping centers or buildings uh, is typically what I'm hunting for uh, when we're going out and looking at deals. Great. So so the the flipping business really taught you some some critical skills that have helped you in the syndication business or, or commercial business, correct? Yeah, without a doubt. Although, you know, I, sometimes I wonder if I'd skipped that and just gone straight into uh, a number of commercial properties, would, would I be even, you know, further along uh, or have that many more deals in portfolio today? And it's hard, hard to say. Uh, no sense in, in, you know, necessarily uh, going hindsight 2020 on that, but it's kind of a, a fascinating thing. Like if you're going to hit the reset button today, I don't know that I would have done all those single family deals or certainly I would have gotten into commercial a lot sooner than I did. So why retail uh, shopping centers? You know, there's obviously there's many asset classes in commercial. So, so why that one? Boy. So one of my most awesome mentors who's become a good friend that that is certainly a category that he has a strong affinity for. And so I ended up seeing a lot of case studies and deals where, you know, we bought it today in this condition, we were able to take it here in a relatively short period of time. Uh, and so I just I saw how that worked over and over and over again on retail. Uh, I'd love to own more units. I do find that today, uh, there seems to be, you know, shortage of, of quality deals that have that value add component. Um, so I will plan to buy more and more apartment units over time. But uh, with retail right now, it seems like, uh, you know, there's a little bit of doom and gloom out there. If you read the headlines or in the media, you've got Sears and JCPenney's and all these, these, um, I guess, historical retailers struggling or maybe reinventing themselves. And so maybe it's a little less competitive of a food group than let's say multifamily apartment, which I think almost every real estate investor can grasp and can understand. And so there might be a little bit less competition in retail. And I'm loving the type of product where it's service centric, right? So it's not going to get cannibalized by Amazon or e-commerce. You know, it's people who are taking their dogs to get groomed. They're getting haircuts. It's the service centric neighborhood tenant that I tend to focus on. Cause for me, that just feels a little bit safer uh, to go after in uh, you know, a landscape of changing retail. And then, one other thing that I've just really come to appreciate is when we do a deal in retail now with a tenant, um, all the work is front loaded and then we can sign a five, seven, 10 year lease that locks in our income stream for however long it is. And after that, the tenants are relatively low maintenance, let's say compared to single family or, or multifamily tenants where you have to have a property manager on site at all times uh, to take care of all the little things that come up just with, with that type of tenant base. Nice. Nice. So less competitive, uh, you know, the service centric tenants, like you were talking about, you know, could you give us some examples of those? So people, uh, when they're thinking about going into retail, they understand like what type of tenant that is. Yeah. So uh, pretty hard to buy your hot cup of coffee online right now. So a Starbucks would be an amazing tenant to have. You know, I, I have in, in my shopping centers today, it tends to be more mom and pop tenants. And so it's folks who have a couple locations or maybe it's, it's their single location and they're going in there five days a week and they're grinding it out. But, you know, if I think down my tenant roster right now, it's, it's a dance studio and it's um, a dog groomer and it's a barber shop. It's a couple of barber shops. It's uh, the local electrical company. It's the local water company. It is, you know, an insurance agent. It's, you know, a restaurant, a bar and a grill. It's, it's a guy making, you know, Mediterranean dishes. And so it's, it's stuff that people are frequently coming back for that, you know, generally isn't getting attacked uh, with the e-commerce model. So service centric, I, I guess you might say, mm -hmm. or uh, your brokers would say internet resistant. And so that resonates with a lot of buyers and owners of a property, at least right now. I like that internet resistant. Yeah, yeah. And and I like the model you said too. You can't can't it's hard to buy a cup of coffee on your smartphone. Uh, <laughs> or I I guess make it appear anyway. Right. Um, so, you know, as far as uh in retail, you know, what are some other things that uh that we wouldn't even know to think about? Like if I'm coming from multifamily or I'm coming from single family, what else should I be thinking about when I'm thinking, okay, you know, I'm gonna focus on retail shopping centers. 
I mean, we, we've all heard in real estate, it's location, 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 right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe it's more important in retail than, than any other asset class, because when you're talking to, you know, the class A retailers of the world, they know their numbers inside and out. And so they can go, hey, based on the demographics in a one, three, five mile radius, the number of cars that are passing by on the road in front of the shopping center, given the good visibility that we have of the shop space, we know we're going to sell X cups of coffee or X amount of Subway sandwiches or whatever that product is, they know their numbers inside and out. And so if you have a B or a C quality location, doesn't mean you can't fill up those buildings or lease them up, but you're probably going to land that type of tenant. Um, Starbucks is, you know, very particular with the type of site that they would select and where they want to locate and who their neighbors are. And you don't necessarily have all of those same factors, at least in my experience with single family, multifamily, you know, an office user may not care as much and, and probably even less so an industrial like warehouse or uh, something along those lines. Hmm. Awesome. So uh, could you tell us about uh, maybe the most recent deal that you all have closed on? Um, yeah, so we actually just hit our 100 day mark on a new property uh, in Phoenix. Uh, so it's in a, a suburb called Goodyear, but uh, we're about 100 days in and we've got some good momentum, you could say. It, it happened, fortunately, a little bit faster than I was expecting, uh, but we have a, a number of leases that have been renewed with existing tenants there. Uh, we have a couple new deals that have been signed, another deal that's pending. Uh, and we're just starting the construction on some of the gray shell space that exists in the building. So when it was originally built, they never built it out for a tenant. Uh, and today that's really how we're adding a lot of the value to the property. We're going to spec out the suites. Or we're going to build them to suit a barber or uh, a classroom type user or a gym user or a physical therapist, all those types of users that would love to locate here. Uh, but don't have the space built out yet. So that one's definitely top of mind. Uh, it's unique in that we've got uh, 16,000 feet of shop space, uh, but we also have a pad site right in front of that building where we could do a deal with a Starbucks potentially or a Chipotle or maybe an in and out with a drive through there and they're on separate parcels. And so it just gives us some really unique opportunities to to ground lease the dirt, to do, let's say, a build to suit where we, we strike a deal with those users. It could end up being a multi-tenant configuration where you put maybe two or three users in a single building that's, you know, three, four, 5,000 feet. And so that's another exciting way to be able to add value to that property through, you know, strategies where you can force appreciation to do some construction, get some deals put together, and then do, you know, the, the cap rate valuation on what tenants like that in this neighborhood would trade at uh, in today's market. Nice, nice. So you were talking about, you know, building out that space, the 16,000 square feet. I mean, that's, that's pretty massive. Um, but tell us, you know, are you going to be building those, you're talking about whether it's for physical therapy or what, you know, your GM, you named off different things. Will you have the tenant in place before you build those or are you going to build it and hope they come? Yeah, in an ideal world, we always have the tenant signed uh, and, and committed to a deal because then we're not risking dollars that may not otherwise come to fruition. You know, the, the, the flip side to that argument is a lot of, let's say, mom and pop users or tenants have a hard time visualizing the space or they're moving fast. And so they don't have a three to six month uh, lead time to say, hey, go ahead and get it built out and get all the plans done, and get, get the permits. Like they wanna move next month. And so with a second gen space that's already built out or if a former user was already in it, they can move that much faster. Um, I was fortunate in that as we started to go through the process of specking out these suites for who knows who, um, we actually had a couple of deals come to fruition. So we could make a slight adjustment to, to our configuration and say, all right, now this is gonna be perfectly suited for a barber. Now this will be perfectly suited for a physical therapist. And as we're going through that permit and, and build out process, they can make some of the adjustments. Hey, this is the flooring that I want. Do you want your ceilings open concept? Or do you like you know, that, the closed grid style? Uh, and so they can have a little bit of feedback along the way or, you know, different tenants, they might say, hey, this is exactly what we need built. And the landlord, you know, takes on all of those costs, or in some cases, the tenant can take on a lot of those costs. So I guess there's a lot, lot of different ways that it can be done. And you talk to different guys who've had different experiences with their buildings or their areas, and they'll tell you, 
um, you know, their preference and why. So I'm, I, maybe I'm kind of a hybrid of those two, just given how these deals are coming together. Sounds like in the, in the, in the commercial or retail space, especially like the project you're talking about, you have to have a really good imagination and you have to be good at like visualizing what this, what this building could be. I mean, it's not like buying a multifamily property. Well, it's, I mean, you gotta you still be creative. There's other opportunities on a multifamily property sometimes that other people haven't seen. However, with that one, I mean, it's, it's anything you want it to be. And it comes in a lot of shapes and sizes too, right? And some people, when they think of retail, it's like, Hey, here's a piece of dirt that, you know, we could build an In-N-Out burger or a McDonald's on. And, and that's where the deal gets done and it structs and McDonald's takes care of everything. You know, on, on another deal I had, it was 100%, you know, every suite was built out and it was a matter of changing out some of the tenants, renewing some of the leases that had burned off, upgrading some of the tenants or bringing in people who can pay market rent where other tenants were paying less than market rent. So I guess, you know, understanding what would be the highest and best use for that, either that box or that building or that neighborhood that's going to benefit you know, the people in that community, but also be great for, you know, the owners of the building, the investors in the building, the lender who, you know, has the note on the property. I, I guess, you know, good, good point. You know, you have to be thinking about all of those things as you're underwriting deals and then executing on them. Who is Vinny Smile Chopra? Came to the U.S. from India with $7 in his pocket, and today he has created a portfolio of over $200 million in commercial real estate. He's a CEO of five companies, acquiring and managing diverse multifamily portfolio of 3,500 units, and his team self-manage all the assets. Vinny has walked the walk with over 26 successful syndications during multiple economic cycles, including downturns over 12 years. He has built a very extensive educational academy to teach and mentor investors. Vinny, tell us about this multifamily syndication academy. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you so much. I'm really proud to really talk to everybody about this extensive multifamily academy that teaches new and sophisticated investors how to use other people's money through syndications. That has been my world, to buy apartments from 50 units to 500 units and how to select emerging markets, how to do deal analyzing, investor education, other people money, syndication blueprints, everything I have learned, I teach in this academy and over 500 lectures and also how to manage the assets also and along with lots of great templates and PowerPoints, everything. And I personally also mastermind coach all my students every Wednesday. So to reach me, Whitney, all the students have to, or investors have to just text the word learn, L-E-A-R-N, learn to 474747 or call my team at 925-766-3518. I appreciate what you just said too, like understanding the highest and best use for that property that's going to benefit the community and everybody involved. And that I would imagine, I mean, that takes some skill. And how, how do you know you're accomplishing that? What's nice is that I, I think the tech and the tools are getting so good that you can let the data drive a lot of your decisions. And so you know, on, on, uh, not this this current deal that I just mentioned, but the one prior, we knew that there was quite a bit of spend happening or leakage, as they say in retail, outside of the city. And so people were you know, buying their, their groceries and their goods and their services up the road uh, on their commute in and out of the property. So in this case, we go to a retailer and say, hey, uh, if you guys opened up a store here, here's the data that supports how much consumers in a one, three, five mile radius are spending on these goods and services. And so you can almost reverse engineer, you know, the best fit for it. Just looking at some of those data, the demographic trends, and then how, how the spend is happening in those areas. And same goes with, you know, site selection or buy another building. So I talked to you know, my brokers in, in Phoenix these days, everyone says, Hey, one of the hottest categories is food users. And so there's a bunch of new restaurants opening and their favorite thing is second gen restaurant space. So they can just come in, retrofit it. And now they're operational in a relatively short period of time for maybe less dollars being spent than a brand new ground up build that takes, you know, however long it takes that, that builder to do it. Wow. 
So Sean, you got you got one minute with somebody that's brand new, and they ask you, you know, Sean, I, I want to get into this this syndication business, and uh, you know, uh, maybe maybe retail, maybe not. I'm not sure. What, what do you tell them? Um, awesome. <laughs> I wish someone would have told me that sooner. Uh, I think if if you're gonna go out and attempt your first deal, I would certainly uh, assemble the Jedi Council. You know, have. Mm-hmm coaches have mentors, you know, I uh, invest with other people who have thousands and thousands of units in their portfolio. So I can see how they're running and operating their business. What a, what a great way to learn from the inside. And then, you know, you have all of our, our vendors that, that help us to really make sure we're doing this right, that nothing slips through the cracks. So I have attorneys do all of the legal work. I have property inspectors, look at all that. I have professional leasing agents helping with our lease up. Uh, we have, you know, licensed general contractors who are doing the building architects who are putting all that together. And so it's nice because, you know, in in the commercial world, all the, the profit, the cash flow, the tax savings are a little bit bigger than, than my experience on single family and residential. And so we can afford to put high quality resources, vendors, and and talented folks, uh, on as, as members of the team, or at least vendors. Uh, to help execute all that. So I'd say, don't just, don't just uh, wing it on a deal of this size. You know, when you're talking about multi-million dollar transactions, we can't afford uh, any, any mistakes uh, So we want to get it right the first time. But you know, when we do that, it can create some really, really unique opportunities just with a single transaction. So how, how did you find your mentor? I guess it was through a referral. I mean, I, I had one set of mentors that really kind of taught me the, the house flipping part of the business. And then, you know, I sought out another mentor who was really a specialist in, in commercial uh, in, in multifamily. And then, uh, you know, over time just started networking with folks who do that as their core business. You meet them at, you know, let's say a mastermind group or a real estate get together. You're going out talking to brokers. You know, in the case of retail, there is a a, a pretty great convention, I guess, what do we call this? Like an industry group, uh, ICSC. So it's, it's the, I don't know if I'll get this right. International consortium of shopping center owners, Mm -hmm. brokers, property managers, and everyone gets together once a year in Vegas I mean, about 35,000 some odd people uh, are talking about what they're doing and they're working on leasing and they're working on buying and they're working on selling. And so it's a really great place to meet people who do the business full time. I uh, actually landed our our last deal there in Vegas, sat down with a broker, uh, talked to her about what our buying criteria was. And she goes, hey, I've got one. It's off market. I've been leasing it. It's got some vacancy. Uh, It has some build out that needs to be done. Uh, would you like to take a look at it? You know, sure enough, we ended up buying that deal. And so uh, that's worked out really well. And she continues to help with leasing and um, might even be, you know, taking the the relisting assignment on the back end if we decide to sell it down the road. Nice. So what, what's been the hardest part uh, for you of, of the, you know, the retail or the you know, large commercial business? The speed. The speed. speed. Yeah. Um, you know, in in single family or even a, a rental house or probably even apartments like you know it, it doesn't take that long to get a deal done right you, you sign a lease uh, you fill up some units you buy the house you fix the house you sell the house in retail things move to me a little a little bit slower so it might be six months to fill up a vacancy it could be nine months uh, people who are doing ground up development might spend well over a year on a project, just getting it out of the ground and, and waiting for those leases to get signed. And then, you know, when you're working with some of the retailers, let's say, uh, they're a little bit more methodical going through it. It's got to go up to the powers that be at corporate, their legal team reviews it, their site manager reviews it. It comes back through the brokers, rounds of revisions, and all of a sudden a couple weeks or, or months has gone by in order to get a single deal done. But, you know, that one deal can be worth hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars of, of profit, uh, you know, depending on the size of the scope, the scale and the, and the length of the lease. Hmm. Nice. So yeah, that, I can imagine, I mean, that's where some experience or some skills going to come into play when you're going to be accounting on a six month vacancy or a year vacancy, or uh, that would be hard to plan for. I mean, if you didn't expect that. 
Yeah. And I, I think that's what someone's got to do going into a deal, especially if it's their first one, right? So assume that that's going to take a period of time. And for, again, fortunately, we can look at some of the data and say, hey, in this area, at this price point with this type of asset, historically, it's taking you know nine to 12 months to get one of these vacancies filled up, like absorption. So we can look at that. We can underwrite some of that into it and say, hey, how how does this deal look if we don't fill it for 12 months? And it's still cash flow. Is it still makes sense? And when it does, you know, what what price point is that deal going to get struck at? Hmm. What's a way that you've recently improved your business that we could apply to ours? Ooh, uh, that's a that's a good question. I I guess for me, I I think so much about the buildings specifically. So that on a, on a day to day or week by week basis is we renewed a tenant. Uh, they're going to stay another five years. And their rate went up, you know, five or ten percent, and so that then trickles down to the NOI. That increases our cash flow. That increases the value of the building by a, a pretty specific amount that we can measure. And so I can look at, at you know, that on paper and say, hey, uh, to my investors, here's what we've been able to accomplish in Q1 of 2019. Or I can turn to my wife and I can say, hey, and here's how much more cash flow we have coming in based on the last deal or two that we've done. And so that that's real and that's tangible. Um, but that's every day in this business, right? Leasing and, and, you know, getting the vacancies filled up, which is what I work on, right? I buy fixer upper buildings that have something inherently wrong with them. So we can go in and solve that problem and then force the appreciation into the property. So I guess that's, that's on a deal basis. Um, and then, you know, as I, I guess I kind of reflect back, maybe it ties into what I said earlier, but um, surrounding ourselves with a star studded cast to support what it is that we're working on. And it doesn't take, you know, a huge staff necessarily. We can use third party property management, you know, vendors, contractors, architects who can help us do a lot of the heavy lifting uh, so that, you know, we do the one thing that we do best. It's like, I find deals, I forge relationships with brokers, and then I give, you know, my friends and my family the opportunity to do deals that would not otherwise be accessible to a lay person. Like these are folks, you know, they're going out and they're busy, they're working their job, but they get to invest in a deal that has, you know, in my case, much higher returns than what I was able to accomplish, you know, in the single family world or as an individual investor where you maybe don't have the economies of scale that we can get in some of the bigger transactions. Awesome. So what's the number one thing that's contributed to your success? probably haven't helped. <laughs> like they're, they're, I'm, I'm not a sharp cookie. I didn't, I don't have a ton of experience doing these deals, but I, I was able to align myself with people that did and do. Uh, and the same goes, you know, kind of with the, the supporting cast of folks. It's just like, Hey, my, my tax guy is a wizard and you know, my brokers that, that I work with are some of the most ex experienced and seasoned guys in town. They've got decades uh, of experience. They've resold some buildings two or three times. And so they can just tell you the history of that corner in town. And, and that helps me fill in all the gaps that I have. And there's plenty of those. <laughs> hmm. Nice. So w what are you excited about right now for the future of your business? I think just continued growth in, in what we're doing. I mean, I, I, I certainly experienced that, you know, as you switch from residential to commercial uh, or make that transition, you know, there's there's a whole different learning curve and you're reestablishing yourself with different brokers, potentially in a different market. Uh, you know, lenders might look at things a little bit differently. And so, you know, as you as you knock out that first, that second, that third deal, the subsequent ones just become so much smoother. Uh, you get looks at properties from the inside you know you brokers are bringing you things that are off market before they list it and i think you know i heard another one of your guests and uh, a gentleman that i really respect talk about this is an imperfect market and it's unfair it's like we i've got an inside track on deals that other people just won't know about unless they have an existing relationship like the reason the broker is bringing it to us is because he knows he's going to get the relisting on the back end if we go to sell it he knows that i'm going to use his team to do the leasing he knows that you know we allow them to double end it so that they can make more commission so you know that's 
that's all kosher in, in commercial real estate and you're kind of trading favors to get some of these deals done. So it makes sense for them. It makes sense for us. It makes sense for our investors that are participating in it. And you know, if we're doing that right, we can, we can put some pretty exciting deals together. Is there a need in your business that you'd like to let the listeners know about? Um, I'd love to have more deals. <laughs> I guess that'd be targeted at uh, any commercial real estate brokers uh, who, who listen or watch the show. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm always open to new introductions when it comes to folks who want to invest. You know, historically, that's always been friends and family. And I, I, I prefer that. But, you know, folks make introductions to each other and they go, hey, um, you know, this is the reason why we love, you know, being a part of commercial syndications. We get the cash flow. We get someone paying down our loan. We have the depreciation. We have the appreciation on the building. And frankly, we don't have to do a lot of the heavy lifting. You've got a sponsor or someone who's putting these deals together doing a lot of that legwork for you. Uh, and they're just able to make money with us, right? And, and I love that you know, our interests are aligned. When you think about a sponsor or investors in the deal or a GP and an LP uh, coming together, it's like, well, we, we get paid when they get paid. And, and I think that's a, 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 a setup that makes a lot of sense. How, how do you like to give back? I'm, I'm big in people getting the skills and the opportunity to go out and help themselves, like teach a man to fish. So, you know, I spent a lot of time over the last couple of years teaching other real estate investors how to do this business, both residential uh, and a little bit on the commercial side as that started to grow more and more from us, uh, or I, I should say in our, in our portfolio. Uh, I love doing things that support the kids. So, you know, we, we've been, I shouldn't say lead sponsors, but supportive of things like junior achievement and things that really, you know, give kids a, a head start. And I think about, we've got uh, an 18 month old and, and a little girl on the way, you know, what it's going to be like for them to grow up in, in a household where they're seeing this type of business or portfolio managed and like what their norm will be set up. And so if, if, you know, we can expose more and more kids to that, it's a, it's a pretty special thing. I know you do some really cool things with uh, your program as well. Well, congratulations on the, on the, on the, well, 18 month old and new one that's on its way on her way. <laughs> going to be a wild year. <laughs> You're going to be tired. No, <laughs> Sean, thank you so much for, for being on the show today. I really appreciate your time and, and just the value you provided about this, the, the retail industry altogether that so many of us are, are not as familiar with, uh, but it's good, uh, uh, good to learn all this from you. And, and, um, uh, uh, did you tell the listeners, uh, how they can get in touch with you? Uh, probably the best way is to go through the website, simplifiedproperties.com. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. And so if you Google me, I, I pop right up too, but uh, that's got all the, the contact info, email. You can book uh, appointments on my calendar right from there too and get a little bit more background about you know some of our projects, what we do and uh, what we expect to have coming for this year. Great. Great. Well, thanks again. And I hope the listeners will uh, reach out to you. And I appreciate the listeners being with us today. I hope you'll go to LifeBridge Capital and connect with me. Also go to the Facebook group, The Real Estate Syndication Show, where we can all learn from experts like Sean and grow our business together. We'll talk to each of you tomorrow. Thanks, Whitney. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.